www.sinihum.com oder alternativ mal 149.22.1.7.134. Ähm, Minecraft Java Edition Anarchie in der Vanilla Edition. Ein Vanilla unmodifizierter Server, auf dem ihr tun und lassen könnt, was ihr wollt. Ähm, genau. Oh, eigentlich wollte ich in dieser Episode wieder bis Bescheid was schauen von warte mal äh, ich habe kein Obsidian mehr ich wollte eigentlich was schauen von äh, dieses Quiz von der CCC wieder aber wie es sich ergeben hat Stimmt, das da hinten schon alles. Ähm, Habe ich jetzt keine Folge von dem Quiz mehr gefunden. Und das ist natürlich äh, durchaus schade. Aber ich habe jetzt einfach einen Ersatz wieder rausgesucht. Und das ist, geht über Klimawandel. Äh, ich hoffe mal, es ist nicht zu politisch und dark und Stimmungskiller und hast du nicht gesehen. Aber äh, ja, äh, ja, das ist es halt jetzt. Das ist jetzt unser Ersatz hier. Klimawandel. Genau, und ähm, Link zu dem Video, was wir jetzt gleich anmachen werden, findet ihr in der Beschreibung, genauso wie die IP-Adresse von diesem gratis äh, zu erreichenden Minecraft-Server. Stimmt das jetzt alles hier so? Ja genau, wir sagen, without further ago, let's go. Achso, 36C3, Chaos West, The Dire Re Reality of Climate Crisis ähm, von äh, Hanno Bock, keine Ahnung. Uh, the dire the reality book? of the climate crisis. Quick question: Who among you was in yeah, this media, year, CCC, 2019? Who uh, has the a demonstration against climate change? For a video from 2019, had 2,200 aufrufe. Like 95, 97% of the audience. Thank you very much. Um, and one of the uh, Fridays for Future demonstrations that I went to was um, very impressive for me because I felt that they had a very interesting balance between the situation is really, really bad and we're all fucked, and on the other hand, but it's not too late, we can do something. So people are getting really scared, but also like uh, constructive and motivated to do something. So it's an em emotional and intellectual roller coaster. And in this talk, we are going to learn a little bit more about what the scientists say and if it's better to freak out or be motivated. And our speaker is Hanno Böck. He's an IT security professional and he writes regularly for the media outlet Golem. And with that, I leave you with him. I hope you learn a lot. Please give Hanno a big warm round of applause and have a lot of fun with this talk. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hello. Um, yeah, uh, just adding to the introduction, like about this, should we be freaked out and should we be motivated? Uh, after last time I gave such a talk, Someone came to me and said, yeah, if I listen to you, it seems like <laughs> uh, this doesn't that. make any sense and, and uh, uh, we will lose anyway, which heavily influenced how I changed the talk for this time. So, but you will see that. Um, so, uh, first I want to show you this graph. This is the worldwide CO2 emissions. It's uh, CO2 only. There are other greenhouse gases, but that's kind of the big issue. And as you can see they are mostly growing and that's kind of the time frame in which we had something like international climate policy um, so like we knew there was a problem i mean some of you may, may, were probably not even born 1990 but uh, humanity knew that there was a problem and we just went on um, so i call this the chart of epic climate failure um, but I also want to point out a few more specific things. There are kind of two points where it goes down a little bit, like notably down. There are a few, like that statistical variation, but there are two points where you can kind of see that emissions went down. Um, one of them is uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed, and the other one is the economic crisis in 2009. Um, and I show you a few more points here. That is kind of important uh, events in international climate policy. So we had the UN Earth Summit in the early 90s, which was basically the start of 
international climate policy. The UNFCCC, which is the UN body to organize the climate conferences, it was founded there. So there the world said, yeah, we have to do something about this. And then there was the Kyoto Protocol, which was uh, praised as the first international binding, which is not technically true, but uh, that's what they said, binding agreement to reduce greenhouse gases, which you can see was very successful, just in the wrong direction. Um, and we had the Paris Agreement and just went on. Um, so, yeah. So, um, where are we? Uh, we are currently at roughly one degree warming, and I, I think one part why we are discussing this now, why this is the big topic here at the Congress, and why, uh, yeah, the, the topic is now part of the mainstream discussion, is that we are actually seeing climate change. So, um, I'm sure you remember, like right now it's really cold, but in the summer it was really hot, and we had several heat records in Germany, we had several instances where it was above 40 degrees, which in the past just was not a thing in Germany. And uh, we right now have uh, a lot of fires in Australia, um, and also in Australia there were plenty of heat records in the past couple of weeks. And this is of course just two examples, I mean there are many more. Um, yeah. So um, what is politics doing about this? So. Um, you probably know that there's this Paris Agreement, which was uh, agreed upon by all nations of the world in 2015. And um, so it's an international treaty where all the nations in the world agreed to three degree of global heating. Well, that's not what it's written in it. It's probably also not what you heard about it. Um, but technically that's what it is. Uh, so. Um, in the text of the Paris Agreement, it says, uh, yeah, the, we want to limit the global temperature rise to well below two degrees Celsius. And well below, is even then it also says uh, we should be pursuing efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degree. We're currently at one degree. So, but the problem is that there's not really any plan how to do this. So Paris Agreement is kind of saying that's what we want. But, yeah, whatever. Um, so, um, how this Paris Agreement works is there's something that is called nationally determined contributions, which basically is voluntary actions by nations. So nations say, yeah, we have a plan to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. That's what we commit to. And um, if you count them together and estimate what the outcome will be, and this is an of official UN document, so it's not from some, I don't know, radical climate scientist, this is the UN, uh, that this adds up to roughly 3.2 degrees temperature rise. Um, and, and that is if the nations commit to what they said, which usually they don't. Um, yeah. So, so to give you a bit of an idea, I mean, in, in the climate discussion, there's often these degree numbers, and to get a bit of an idea, like currently we're at one degree above what it was before humanity started emitting greenhouse gases. Um, then the Paris Agreement kind of says we should get limited to at least two degrees, and it would be better to limit it to 1.5 degrees. But uh, the actual Paris Agreement commitments are uh, around three degrees, um, and if you have a realistic view on current policy, it's maybe more. Um, yeah, so what is the science saying about this? So um, there's uh, this institution called the IPCC, which is an uh, international uh, science gremium, and they are, they, are, they are not doing research themselves, but they are creating a summary of of the climate research, so trying to, to find the essence of what the science figured out. Um, and th so they create regular big reports, but the last one is kind of outdated by now. Um, and they published a special report which gained quite some attention uh, in 2018, and this was a direct reaction to the Paris Agreement because 
the Paris Agreement said this 2 degree, 1.5 degree, and so they said, yeah, the scientists should figure out what does it mean, 2 degree, 1.5 degree, what's the difference, and uh, there were kind of two main messages from this report. Uh, one of it is that there's a big difference between 1.5 degree and 2 degree, and the other message is that 1.5 degree is still doable under some optimistic assumptions. Um, so, what does that mean, 1.5 degree or 2 degree? Uh, so, uh, here's a nice picture of some coral reefs. Um, unfortunately, I have to tell you that uh, in the future there won't be any more such pictures because soon they will all look like this, very likely. Um, what this report estimated is that if you have 1.5 degree, uh, we will probably lose at least 70% of coral reefs worldwide. Uh, if we have 2 degree, basically almost all the coral reefs will be lost, will be destroyed. And I mean currently even 2 degrees seems ambitious. Um, it, it will happen much more often that the Arctic will be ice free. For 1.5 degree, this is estimated to be. Uh, this is switched. Sorry, that's a mistake. <laughs> so for 1.5 degree, it's estimated every 100 years, and for 2 degree, it's estimated every 10 years. Um, then it's expected that 2 degrees will mean more sea level rise. Um, it, it's a relatively minor difference here, but still, I mean, that matters for, for nations where every centimeter means uh, more area loss. Um, and uh, this, I think, this is one of the things that, um, that, that very directly impacts humans, the estimate of how many people will be affected by extreme heat, and extreme heat can also mean something like you cannot just go outside anymore without uh, any kind of uh, cooling support. Uh, that this will be more than doubled uh, with 2 degrees Celsius. Um, and always keep in mind, right now we're on a path to 3 degrees. So, uh, yeah. Um, so, what would be needed to achieve uh, 1.5 degrees? So, the path would be roughly reduce the greenhouse gas emissions by 50% in the next 10 years and uh, come to a carbon neutral state by roughly 2050. Um, so, um, but um, lately there has been quite some discussion is um, the IPCC is telling us the full story or if they are rather underestimating some of the effects of climate change. Um, so many scientists are worried that the IPCC is too conservative because like they are kind of trying to create a consensus of the view of the scientific community and they also have a lot of pressure from, because I mean you know that there are uh, basically uh, uh, nations that where the head of state denies that climate change exists and <laughs> these US. people also fund the IPCC so there's a lot of pressure from people who basically don't believe in climate change and also there's this consensus view which can lead to that maybe more more uh, outliers that they are not uh, viewed as much even though you probably should also have a look at what the worst outcome would be. Um, and there's been a, a kind of meta study where some scientists looked at IPCC predictions and compared them to um, uh, to what actually happened and they came to the conclusion yeah uh, the evidence suggests that scientists have been too conservative in their projections of the impacts of climate change. Uh, we suggest, therefore, that scientists are biased not towards al alarmism, but rather the reverse towards cautious estimates, where we define caution as erring on the side of less rather than more alarming predictions. Um, and, like, recently this has been picked by, up by the New York Times, where uh, they had this article which was a bit... Um, was a bit problematic because it, it kind of uh, has a like, uh, somewhat uh, populist uh, headline how scientists got climate change so wrong. Um, I mean, there were scientists who were warning about this and did it in part a reason of the process. 
Um, but also occasionally you can then be read headlines like this where it says uh, climate models have accurately predicted global heating study finds. And mm, th that, uh, this was based on a study where they came to the conclusion we find that climate models published over the past five decades were generally quite accurate in predicting global warming in the years after publication. Um, so uh, maybe do you find that confusing? I also find these things occasionally confusing when I read, okay, climate scientists, they were underestimating the effects, and then it says, okay, they were very accurate, actually. Um, but there's, uh, usually if you dig down a bit, there's an explanation, and the explanation here is uh, that actually climate scientists have probably underestimated the effects of uh, climate change, but uh, their models on, on temperature rise have been very accurate. Um, yeah, mm, sorry. Wrong slide. Um, so, um, I, I mean that can both be true, right? So the uh, the prediction on the average world mean temperature has been very accurate, but that's usually not what we care about. We care about things like storms, like fires, like heating, on like more local events which directly impact humans. Um, and if you're more interested in that, I recently uh, watched a very interesting interview. This is on YouTube. Uh, I have linked it here. So, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, then you may be wondering, like, the climate scientists are telling us, yeah, we need to act very fast to avoid the worst outcomes of climate change, but, but we can still do it. And m maybe you have heard something like that 10 years ago, and you wonder, how is that possible? And because, like, as I kind of said, the science did not get more optimistic. And uh, the reason for that is that climate scientists recently started adding something called negative emissions into their models, which means they estimate that in the future we will be able to reverse uh, emitting CO2. And so most of these scenarios that they are calculating where we achieve 2 degree or 1.5 degree, they are estimating that that's what we will do in the future. And so, um, so you may wonder how can we do negative emissions? Uh, we can do things like planting trees because a tree, when it grows, it sucks in CO2 from the air and that is turned into wood. Um, that is great, but it has very obvious limits because the Earth has only a finite amount of land. And the, the amount of land where we can plant trees will probably get smaller due to climate change because we will have sea level rise and we will have uh, more heat. Uh, so we should plant trees um, a lot, but um, it's the, there's only so much you can do here. And so we need to talk about something which is called carbon capture and storage. Um, the idea here is that we get carbon dioxide and then we store it underground. And originally this um, entered the discussion in the context of building new coal power plants. For example, in Germany, I remember uh, roughly 10 years ago, uh, I was living in Karlsruhe back then and there was a new coal-fired power plant built in Karlsruhe, and some people were saying, hey, isn't that not so good for the climate? And then uh, some people said, yeah, that's no problem because we already planned in the future to use CCS on that plant. Um, that never happened, but um, that's how they um, said it then. And uh, this is not just happening, it was not just happening in Germany, basically CCS for coal or gas plants that has largely been a failure. Um, so today there's only a handful of projects running and the, the impact is it's minimal, so it's really small and the, most of the projects that are running are in the context of something which is called enhanced oil recovery and what they're doing there is they're pumping CO2 into old oil fields and can squeeze a bit more oil out there. Now you maybe get the idea that uh, that's maybe not the best thing for the climate as well because that means more oil. And um, 
But in order to get to negative emissions, we need to do something different. And one way is uh, you could imagine doing bioenergy, like for example using biogas plants or burning wood, and then coupling that with CCS. So I don't know, for example, you, you burn wood and then you capture the emissions and then you store them underground. Um, now this obviously has all the problems that you usually have with bioenergy, that is, um, it, it competes with, uh, with land for food and uh, if you use uh, pesticides and uh, fertilizers, that has a climate impact as well. And if you plant, I don't know, palm oil where there was previously a rainforest, then it is really ha terrible for the climate. So that's not a very good solution and uh, basically the, the discussion is moving away from that because people realize the, the effects of bioenergy are so negative that it's probably not a good idea to do that. Uh, another thing you could do for negative emissions is called direct air capture, which means you run a big machine that uh, sucks in air and extracts the carbon dioxide and then you store that underground. Um, that technically works, so there are a few startups working on that, um, but um, these machines themselves will of course require a lot of energy and it is questionable how realistic it is to scale that up to international levels. And I'll get later to actually how much energy we are talking about here. A and obviously the energy that you use for that needs to come from something like wind or solar because if you fire it by a coal-fired power plant that does not make any sense. Um, so. So one criticism here is that the IPCC in their optimistic scenarios uh, largely rely on technology that does not really exist at scale. Like their test installations, but uh, yeah, they, they have very optimistic outlooks and how, how fast this can be scaled up. Um, and even if the technology kind of works, you, you wonder, can wonder how this should work economically and politically because like for someone to run a negative emission plant, uh, th there's no profit in that. So you would probably have it, I don't know, stage funded, and then there's the question of who pays for that, and why, why should a country do that? You basically have the same problems you have with climate policy with reducing emissions. That, yeah. Um, so, um, another um, issue with the science is uh, this discussion about so-called tipping points and feedback loops. And this is uh, probably the most worrying criticism of the current climate science. Um, so, um, yeah. Uh, so, we have a lot of feedback loops in the Earth system, which is, to put it short, when we have warming and that causes even more warming. So an example for this is um, when ice is melting, because um, as you can see on this picture, ice is very bright, but water is very dark. That, that means if there's sunlight shining on ice, then it's reflected, a lot of it. And if the, if the ice melts, uh, then the sunlight is shining on the ocean, and, uh, uh, and that means less energy is reflected. So this means if we have melting ice, then we have more warming uh, following that. Um, this is called the albedo feedback loop. Um, fuck, fuck, fuck. And hoch. these uh, tipping points, uh, you, you call something a tipping point when you have a, a system that at some point uh, it, it will uh, turn into a process that something collapses and even if we stop further emissions. And uh, one example for that, where, where it's generally assumed by science that this is already happening, is the West Antarctic Ice Shield. So the, the assumption is that well, even if we stop so emitting CO2 out. now, or, and the planet is not getting any warmer, that this ice shield will com completely melt down. And that, in the long run, will mean uh, one to three meters of sea level rise, just by the West Antarctic Ice Shield. And there's probably more ice shields that that will melt. Um, and there's the, uh, 
there's the risk that these feedback loops and tipping points could could cause uh, a cascade what? where uh, some effects cause more warming that uh, that brings some other processes in motion and that causes even more warming. And um, there's been a study uh, in 2018 which is kind of known as the Hothouse Earth study where they looked at, at various of these tipping points and feedback loops and how they interact. And um, they came to the conclusion that even with just uh, two degrees of warming, uh, it may be that we end up in such a scenario. Now, um, I want to add some caveats here. One is that there is significant uncertainty. So when scientists say this may happen with two degrees, that doesn't mean they are sure about it. That means they are worried that this could happen. And also, these are long term effects. So we're talking here about hundreds or thousands of years. So this is not probably not something you will experience or I will experience. Um, so yeah, what would need to happen? Um, obviously, we need to stop burning fossil fuels, right? So we 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 really need to get rid of something like this. This is the Jenschwalde open cast mine. It's uh, near the border to Poland. Um, if I recommend everyone that, that you you go to one of these open cast mines and look at it because it, it's really kind of uh, looks like a nightmare scenario. Um, there's one very close here in uh, it, it's uh, roughly half an hour with the train. Okay, das schaffe ich nicht mehr, uh, so oder zeitlich? I don't know, maybe if after the Congress ja, ich muss das auch nicht hochladen. Um, yeah. Okay, passt hier alles? Um, one kind of good news here is that it's probably much easier to build renewable energies than we thought in the past. Um, there's, I, I really like this graph. This is from a Dutch researcher called Auke Hoekstra. And what he did was, um, the black line is the worldwide installations of uh, solar energy. And the colorful lines here are the predictions of the uh, International Energy Agency. So. What you can see here, like the International Energy Agency kind of always assumes that solar power is more or less flat, even though it's growing exponentially. Uh, and they, they notice that their starting point, they have to move that, but they don't really seem to notice that they are not getting a trend here. Um, so, uh, and that also means like a lot of people are relying on these uh, reports from the International Energy Agency. Uh, so, we can probably be more optimistic about the outlook of renewable energy than what is usually assumed by governments. Um, so, so, what usually the big plan is for, for uh, reducing greenhouse gases is, yeah, we should switch to carbon-free electricity, and then we should use electricity for everything. Um, so, um, oh, just that you get a bit of an idea, that is how worldwide electricity production is. The big thing is coal. Um, the uh, green thing and the blue thing, that is renewable energy. Hydro is the biggest one, because that humanity has been using for a long time. But the green thing is growing rapidly. And I, I mean, I can easily imagine that we manage to solve this and get the green thing to cover everything with the growth rates we currently have in renewable energy. Um, but uh, what worries me a bit is thinking about how much electricity we will need in the end. And just to give you some numbers, uh, we currently have uh, roughly 26 petawatt hours per year uh, worldwide electricity production. And that is uh, only a small share of overall energy production. That is uh, 160 petawatt hours, um, which includes everything from heating and cars and airplanes and industry. So somehow we need to turn all that into uh, renewable energy electricity use. Um, it will get more efficient in some sen some situations. For example, an electric car is more efficient than uh, gas-powered car, but but still this is a lot. And then there are things like, if we want to turn the petrochemical industry, so plastics, chemicals, into uh, use 
renewable energy for that. We can do this by using something called carbon capture and use, or also called power to X. Uh, there was a talk on that on the camp. If you want to watch that, uh, that was very good. Uh, but there, there's been a study that if we want to turn the current petrochemical industry uh, use renewable energy for that, it would be something between 18 and 32 petawatt hours per year. So that is a kind of, we, we would need all the electricity we have today worldwide, uh, uh, like double that just to replace the petrochemical industry. And we talked earlier about these negative emissions. Um, this is a number from the IPCC report where they estimated that we might need uh, 43 petawatt hours per year by 2100 just for negative emissions, just to remove the CO2 that's already in the atmosphere and that's causing harm. Um, and like uh, in a talk here two days ago by a scientist, he said, uh, yeah, that sounds crazy, but we will do that because climate change will be so bad. Um, so, so looking at that, I mean, you can easily see we will probably not just uh, need the electricity we then generate today and make that with green electricity, but probably multiple times that. And I, uh, uh, where should all the electricity come from? I have a hard time imagining that. I mean, uh, the, the good news is renewable energy is not really limited. We have, uh, if you think about putting solar plants in the desert or using offshore wind energy, there's plenty of space, but it's obvious that this is really, really challenging. So, um, and we're not just talking about energy. Uh, there are some things that are even harder. So, um, this is a cement plant. Um, who knows how cement is made? Ich weiß nicht, wieso ich überhaupt noch Creeper farme. So viel TNT wie ich habe. You're using uh, limestone, which is uh, mostly uh, calcium carbonate, and then you burn it uh, with a lot of heat, and then what you get out is uh, calcium oxide and CO2. So, um, so the the thing in this formula is that you can see there's CO2 on the right side, and that is part of the chemistry. That does not come from the energy we need to make cement, but the chemistry to make cement emits CO2. And there is not really any technology to avoid that, except using something like this here. And this alone, these cement emissions, the chemical cement emissions, that is 5% of the worldwide uh, carbon dioxide emissions. Um, so the only plan really to do something about it would be either using CCS or using uh, these direct air capture plants to later get the emissions back out of the air. Um okay, yeah, the talk is not a half an hour, but I would say we're uh, here. Weg. Schnell den Chunk wegladen. Um Genau, weil das ist schon praktischer, wenn man da zu zweit ist. Äh, ich habe ungefähr nichts mitgenommen aus dem Video. Ähm, passiert auch mal. War eine aufregende Folge und war irgendwie ein schwerer zu verdauendes Video für, für, den, für den Sidewatch. Ähm, oh, da sind Fackeln. Sind die von dem Dorf? I don't know. Äh, genau, und dementsprechend... Ja würde ich sagen, was ist jetzt mit der mit dieser Episode von der Dauerwerbesendung für diesen äh, Minecraft-Server. Link zum unvollständig geschauten Video findet ihr in der Beschreibung, wenn ihr da weiterschauen wollt, bei 31 Minuten und 20 Sekunden. Ähm, auf dem mediaccc.de Channel Naja, Link ist natürlich in der Beschreibung, genauso wie die IP-Adresse zu diesem Server hier. Ähm, schaut auch mal vorbei. Und ähm, Oh, das ist gar nicht kaputt gegangen hier, interessant. Ah, hier war wahrscheinlich ein Berg. Okay. Hat sie den Berg zerlegt. Ja, interessant. Ähm, genau. Dann äh, sehen wir uns in der nächsten Folge. Ciao.